All right, let's look at the next two passages on the same story, Mark 9, 1 through 9. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, but shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them, or, you know, can't launder them to get bleach them to get any whiter. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said, un, said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And then uh, in the Luke passage, the, uh, relating the same story, Luke 9, 28 through 36, and it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of these things which they had seen. So obviously very consistent in the story. The, they, they quoted uh, Peter exactly as, it, as he said and, and God speaking to them. And... Uh, the transfiguration of Christ was a monumental experience in the life of Peter, as we can imagine. You know, uh, if we would see something like that, wow. I'm sure we'd be sore afraid, you know, first of all. And as Christ transfigured and appeared in his glory before Peter, James, and John, this lesson studies Peter's presence in the transfiguration and his response to this special moment. While many applications can be made from this story, Perhaps the most important lesson for us today learned from Peter is the importance of godly reverence. The rev to reverence Christ is a key attribute of a committed follower of him. So the education of the disciple continues. It seems that in Christendom and culture as a whole has become increasingly more casual and less reverent. And if you uh, caught the message Wednesday night, we talked about the difference between being an admirer and a follower of Jesus Christ. If you missed that, I urge you to watch that Wednesday because it talks about that. You know, the, we can, uh, a lot of people agree with what he might say, but to follow him is a different matter. And that's what they're going to learn today here. Because yet still, the study of the scriptures show the importance of honoring and reverencing the Lord. The psalmist of 46.10 said, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. He is to be exalted. The prophet Malachi conveyed the words of God in Malachi 1.6. It says, A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? 
And if I be a master, where is my fear? In other words, you know, if I'm already at the top of the food chain. Who am I going to honor? You know, my kids are supposed to honor me. It stops here. I'm a master. The slaves serve me. I, I'm at the top. So who am I going to honor if, if I put myself at the top of that food chain? Well, the Lord of hosts, uh, the, these passages clearly convey that our God is deserving of honor. When the disciples asked the Lord to teach them to pray, the first thing he taught them was reverence. It says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're to hallow his name, keep, keep it above all, all else. In today's society, honor is given to so many things and many people, but God desires and deserves honor above all else. In a culture where adulation and veneration is given to athletes, actors, business leaders, and even some politicians, not too many, <laughs> but Christians need to realize that God alone deserves the highest respect. Isaiah delivered God's proclamation, said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. God expects and deserves the glory. Our text shows Jesus teaching the Apostle Peter the importance of reverence while on the Mount of Transfiguration, a lesson we can learn afresh today. First, we see then, number one, the Lord's program. The Lord had a program for this. Often in the Gospels, Jesus invites his inner circle disciples, Peter, James, and John, away from the other men and enable uh, them to spend some uh, alone time with him and concentrate on them. Special opportunities that would enable them to focus on their Lord. Luke's account mentions that they went up into a mountain for the specific purpose of praying. Uh, Matthew simply states that Jesus brought them up into a high mountain apart. From this example and others, we see that the effective prayer time often involves separating oneself from the hustle and bustle of daily life. We need to get alone with him. In fact, Matthew 6, 5 and 6 there on your bulletin tells us, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. In other words, you get away. You know, the only time uh, I ever prayed was up here. You know, that would not be right. I think you'd all recognize that. You know, we need to get alone and, and pray in secret with God. Though God is not calling us to a meeting like the one he had with Peter here, he does invite us to come into his presence every day. It's important to separate from the busyness of our schedules and take time to hear from the Lord and bask in the glory of his presence. And I meditate on that. I thought, wow, you know, we, yeah, we go to pray, but do we bask in his glory? You know, and it just hit, here we're a loud audience with God the creator of the universe. We ought to just stop when we start and enjoy that. that he's going to take time to hear just from me. That, you know, that gives us reason to just bask in the, in the glory of, of what he's enabling us to do and really allowing us to do, to speak to him directly. So we see J Jesus then, he sets up a conference, letter A. Here's a picture of the conference on the mount with the uh, uh, disciples. And Matthew, and again from our text, it's there in your bulletin again, Matthew 17, 1 through 3. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth him up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. And I think you all know Elias refers to Isaiah, just the... Uh, Jewish name for that. While we don't know the precise mountain where our story takes place, here on what is referred to as the Mount of Transfiguration, the Lord 
and his and lowered his face in his raiment is as bright as the sun and uh, communed personally with Moses and Elijah. Throughout, I said Isaiah, I'm sorry, Elijah. <laughs> I'll get it straight. Throughout the New Testament, the scribes and the Pharisees gave the utmost reverence to the trio of Abraham, Moses, and Elijah. Peter was soon to learn that Christ deserved reverence above even these men. The Lord deserved honor on a far higher level than even the patriarchs. Represented by Abraham, the lawgiver, represented by Moses, and the prophets, represented by Elijah. What a privilege for Peter, James, and John, and really even Moses and Elijah, to enter this moment of communion with God. And I think on uh, that is you just think, because in, yet in this privilege, we have equal status with those who are accounted as the greatest of godly men. Wow. Just as he allowed them to be there, he allows us to be there. That, you know, again, is to, to meditate on that a little and let that sink in that, we get audience with him just like these men did on the Mount of Transfiguration. In fact, we are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may receive what we need from the hand of our Heavenly Father. There need not be any timid timidity, no hesitation. Yes, we are unworthy, completely so, but we are the sons of God. Joint heirs with Christ. Our communion with him was God's desire from the foundation of the world. This is the way it was meant to be, and because of the Savior, this is the way it can be, if we will only accept the invitation. On your worksheet, Romans 8, 31 and 2, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. In Revelation 22:17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whoever will, let whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. One of those wonderful uh, whosoever verses that we have that, we're all allowed and can take that step to come to him freely. Uh, I don't know how many of us uh, have flown first class. Anybody, probably not too regularly, but I'm sure a couple of people have. Um, but first, as you know, first class privileges on an airline don't come because of what your name is or what you've done, but it's because the price has been paid. Almost every time I've gone, it's because the company paid for it. I wasn't going to spend that kind of money, you know. And, uh, or maybe get a, they used to get a, you know, a $50 upgrade back in the day. You know, I might try that. But it's because the price has been paid for that special seat. Well, Jesus has paid the price required for the privilege we enjoy of fellowshipping intimately with God. And to be on that first class seat to heaven, I think, too, you know. Praise God. It's a privilege we should not take for granted. Uh, there's an illustration here, and it refers to it. They're kind of listed on your bulletin, but they're not. The verses aren't there uh, out of Esther. And it shows the king held out his golden scepter to Esther and invited her into his presence to ask her petition. Even so, we have been invited to the presence of our most heavenly king to bring our petitions to him. So... If you remember the story, Mordecai was encouraging Esther to go and, and plead the case uh, for the Israelites. And uh, she answered back that, uh, you know, if, if he doesn't call for you, he, he puts you to death. If he doesn't recognize you, you know, so she's, she's kind of reminding Mordecai, hey, this, this could be fatal, what you're asking me to do, because he has not called for me. Well, then... Uh, uh, then in Esther 5, 1 through 3, it says, Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. 
And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given to thee half of the kingdom. I thought, there's a Valentine's story, true love, giving her half the kingdom, you know, and just because uh, he loved her so much. I like that. You know, that's called uh, marriage in Washington State, you know, with the uh, equal property thing. But I just like that. that uh, I just thought that's just so appropriate. And then later, Esther uh, 8, verses 3 and 4, says, Then Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite, Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. Well, we have something even better than a golden scepter. You know, God's reached out to us with letter B, the cross. Even better to give us recognition and acceptance into his presence. From our Luke text, it said, Luke 9, 30 and 31, And behold, there talked with them two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So he, was, he said the cross is coming, right there in our verses. While the lives of Moses and Elijah were ones of significant impact, Peter would soon learn that the central event of all history was to be the crucifixion and later the resurrection of Christ at Jerusalem. In our last lesson, we saw Peter brought to understand forcefully that this had to occur. No matter how he may have felt personally, here we see the death of the Lord described as something he would accomplish. It, it said this word translated accomplish, according to Strong's concordance, means to fulfill or to carry through to the end. In other words, Jesus came for that purpose and he was going to accomplish it. Interestingly and wonderfully, Jesus said these words from the cross. It is finished. He had done what he came for. In Hebrews chapter 10, we learn that the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary fulfilled and superseded all other sacrifices. This was the ultimate purpose of them all. The duties of the Old Testament priest pictured and foreshadowed what Christ would do when the fullness of time was to come. So again, we understand that the cross was the completion or the fulfillment of Jesus' earthly mission. On your worksheet, there is Hebrews 10, 10 through 14. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Praise God, the cross. And in Galatians 4, 4 and 7, also on the worksheet. For when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Wow. He's right. We are sons of God and the Lord Jesus. In Psalm 22 and in Isaiah 53, we saw the suffering and the death of Christ on Calvary that were prophesied in graphic fashion and just how difficult a time and, and uh, you know, just how demeaning it was. And at that very time of fulfillment, we see Christ's uh, re his reaction to that there in Matthew 26, uh, verses 39 and 42 on your worksheet says, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. He went away the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Just so willingly. And just a little bit later then, he's speaking to Peter after Peter reached out and cut off the ear of one of the captors. He said in verse 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? Wow. Just right there, it shows how willingly he went to fulfill the scriptures. Could have called down all the angels he wanted and needed to take care of a little garrison of Roman soldiers and, and you know, the lawgivers. Wow. But we go back to the mountain. We have the disciples' proposal, number two. It must have been a breathtaking experience for the disciples to see the Son of God transfigured before their very eyes. The Word of God says his face was shining as the sun and his raiment was as white as the light or as the snow. So there's three verses, uh, again, from our uh, text this morning out of the different Gospels that say Matthew 17, 2 and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Mark 9, 3 told us, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And then the Luke 9, 29, and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. Wow. The uh, we see it again there, the transliteration of the Greek word used here for transfigured is metamorpho, which we get the word metamorphosis. We often use this word to describe the transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly. There was a complete change here. They had seen Jesus now for years in appearance as a normal man. Now they were seeing him as much as they could with mortal eyes in his glory. I thought that, yeah, they recognized him as Jesus, you know, not too long before this. But now they saw, wow, this is what it's going to be like when we truly see him. The personal experience of the glory of God had a remarkable effect on Moses. whose references uh, there listed on your worksheet. I just want to read a few out of Exodus. Uh, uh, Exodus 33, 18 through 20 said, And Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Um, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Wow. And then Exodus 34, 5 through 8. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the father upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And what was Moses' reaction to that? in uh, uh, chapter 34, verse 8. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Wow. Boom. You know, that's what I was thinking this morning. We ought to, instead of even standing in reverence, we ought to hit our knees <laughs> when we reverence the Lord Jesus. That's what you see every time in the Bible, people worship. And then in Exodus 34, 29 through 35, again with Moses, and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Didn't even know he was glowing. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. So they, they see him glowing just from being in the presence of God. And now these disciples there on the mount were witnessing it firsthand to see that. Undoubtedly, 
the three disciples were awestricken when they beheld the glory of God. But then, as happened on several other occasions, Peter did not remain silent for long. And old Peter just can't help but speak up. He wanted, letter A, the tribute. He wanted the tribute. The very first thing Peter said was a wonderful response to a marvelous experience. It was properly stated and it was absolutely accurate. All three gospel accounts quote Peter as saying, Master, it is good for us to be here. Have you experienced situations in life which you could say, it is good for us to be here? I think, you know, you hear me say that often. It's good to be in church today. You know, and that, and that is a good place. If you feel the presence of God and hear the word of God, it's a good place to be. A good place to be. Well, do you truly appreciate what God is doing while it is happening? Or is it something you see only in hindsight? It is a wise man who recognizes at the time when something special of a spiritual nature is going on. The Spirit of God may move in a church service, a camp service, a special meeting between two individuals, yet often believers seem unaware of the significance of God working in that moment. One of God's greatest sorrows is that his own people have come to take him for granted. Oh, I beg, you know, it's all that we just never take him for granted give him the recognition for what he is doing and does. We see proof of this in Malachi 1 verses 6 through 14, where God chastises his priests for not giving proper honor to his house and his plan. They had long again, long ago, lost their sense of reverence for God. Worship and service had become simply a job and worse, a burden. And I, it was a long passage and at first I thought, oh, Valentine's Day, my well skipped it. But I just, I really felt this morning of uh, reviewing that, um, you know, it's worth reading this because it, it demonstrates a watered down version of their worship. And so much we see in the, in the broader church, I think, watered down Christianity, you know, and, and maybe even us personally just kind of, well, you know, uh, maybe this month I don't have to do so much, you know, getting used to it. Sometimes we just t take things in bad habit. Well, so I wanted to share what Malachi says in verse 1, verses 6 through, chapter 1, 6 through 14. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Far from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, in that ye say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it! And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand? saith the Lord. But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, said the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Wow. Oh, church, I just, uh, uh, we, I just pray for the church never to be like what they're talking about, to never lose our reverence and our anticipation and excitement for God. 
We need to be followers, not admirers, and say the right things. How do we recognize God working in our daily lives? How can we attribute daily blessings to him as they happen? To do this, we must walk in the spirit, being sensitive to his leading and responsive to his guidance. As we draw closer to him and away from negative influences, our perspective changes. We can learn to appreciate God's goodness and blessing in our lives. In this passage, Peter truly was giving honor to whom honor was due. This ought to be the desire and burden of the heart of every believer to honor God. He wanted, then, letter B, the tabernacles as the tribute. While Peter's first statement was excellent, he continued to talk. And that's often the case with us, too, isn't it? He said too much, <laughs> went a little too far. He impulsively purposed that tabernacles be built for Moses, Elijah, and the Lord. Luke described Peter as not knowing what he said. Peter believed the occasion called for a religious ceremony of some sort. Remember, the Jews had a history, a great occasion. You know, they'd set up the altar, the, you know, and the little tabernacles and the rocks to, to commemorate it. So, you know, it's kind of in his nature and background to think that way. But he was soon to find out differently. There's a great illustration here. A preacher was aboard a jetliner, which hit some turbulence and began shaking violently. In a panic, a, few, a fellow passenger who had made the preacher's acquaintance begged him, quick, pastor, do something religious. The preacher promptly took an offering. <laughs> wow, I was going to have Josh pass the plate there. But don't we sometimes substitute religious rituals for the privilege of a real relationship with God? We see that out there for sure too often. The issue was this. Peter was actually placing Moses and Elijah on an equal plane with the Lord, the Son of God, the creator of the universe. In Peter's thinking, each deserved a tabernacle and was entitled to honor. Again, as we saw in our last lesson, Peter seemed to have lost sight of who he had acknowledged Jesus to be. He tried to keep Christ from going to the cross. Now he was unwittingly denying Christ his rightful place in worship. He was lacking in the proper reverence for the Lord, and he was about to receive another necessary lesson in the course of his education as a disciple. He was going to hear directly from God the Father. Number three, the Father's proclamation. The central doctrine to all Christianity is that Jesus is God. Jesus himself attested to be, being a part of the triune God when he said, I and my Father are one. This was the truth that people living during this time, the scribes and the Pharisees included, refused to accept. John 10, 31 through 33 tells us there on the worksheet, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father, for which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, maketh thyself of God. Still, in all three gospel accounts of today's story, God the Father proclaimed Jesus to be his beloved son. We need to letter A hear the son. And we need to listen to him and to his word. When Christ was baptized by John in the Jordan River, God the Father stated in an audible voice, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And on the occasion of the transfiguration of Christ, he said again, This is my beloved Son, and further commanded, Hear him. But this solemn proclamation Peter especially, along with James and John, was brought to realize that it was Christ and Christ alone, God's beloved Son, who was to have his full attention. They were not to hear Moses and Elijah at this time and were never to worship them. Seth's reverence was to be reserved solely for the Lord Jesus Christ. The first step toward victory in the life of every believer is to hear God's word. Indeed, it is the first step towards the salvation itself. 
Romans 10, 17 states, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There is no salvation without the word being permitted to do its work in the heart. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, and faith comes through hearing the word of God. On your worksheet, Jeremiah 23, 29, it's not my word, is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Isaiah 55, 10, 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it, that everything and said everything with a purpose. Peter, James, and John heard the audible voice of God the Father. Today, the written word of God tells us what he wants us to know. God has left his word with us today as a living book that speaks to the needs of our hearts. We should listen to what it says while silencing other voices that try to steal our attention. On the worksheet there, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Wow. There's a, uh, in late 1998 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a series of attention getting billboards began to appear. The sponsor was anonymous, but the messages were clear. Have a little sampling. I won't have time to do all of them, but there's a few good ones. And it's a, all these are with the author God. It said, let's meet at my house Sunday before the game. God. We need to talk. God. Love the wedding. Invite me to the marriage. God. That love thy neighbor thing. I meant it. God. I love you and you and you. God. My way is the highway, God. You think it's hot here? God. Have you read my number one bestseller? There will be a test. God. Do you have any idea where you're going? God. Don't make me come down there. God. And I can think of 10 things that are carved in stone. God. And then finally, I don't question your existence. God. Well, we, we hear, then we need be to heed the Son. It is clearly understood that God wants us not to just hear, but also to obey. In Matthew 7, 24, we see Christ's definition of a wise man. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. A.W. Tozer explained it this way, it is not just trust, it is not just obey, it is trust and obey. It's been said that if we all looked into a mirror the first thing in the morning and liked what we saw, the world economy would soon collapse because of all the various cosmetics and devices would no longer be needed. So I looked that up this morning, it's a $500 billion uh, industry, just the cosmetics. And you think about it. And that used to be maybe a collapsible thing. Now it's just one third of a stimulus payment. So I don't you know, it, this was written a while ago, but I like that. The victorious Christian life is only experienced by one who both hears and obeys God. It's living by God's word and not merely listening to it. That brings blessing to the life of a Christian, to be a follower, not an admirer. The pages of God's word are filled with stories of those who obeyed God and were in turn both used and blessed 
and also with that accounts of those who do, chose to do the opposite. While the choices to follow God in obedience is an easy or can be a hard one for us to make, it still runs contrary to our nature. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. God's answer for this problem is for us to crucify the flesh daily. During your worksheet, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I, day, I die daily. And Galatians 2, 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is baseline reverence. Not a feeling or a mood, but a choice that needs to be renewed daily. A choice that leads to a transformed life and a true state of discipleship. This is education, not just of the head, but of the heart and of the will. Would you be a disciple of Christ? Then learn the lesson of reverence. So in conclusion, these passages on the transfiguration of the Lord help us to see Christ as a God-man and help us to realize that he is the Lord of all and above all. He alone is worthy of our reverence. The story also helps us to understand that we must choose to not only hear God, but to obey him. The writer of Hebrews said that we ought to, quote, serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear, to respect and revere who and what God is. They're closing on your worksheet, uh, Psalm 89, 7. says, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence all of them that are about him. We are all to hold him in reverence. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we uh, just uh, thank you again uh, for your Peter and the example he is to us in, in uh, learning uh, true reverence, that you are above all names. Lord, help us to uh, all give you your proper place in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, that we put you at the pinnacle of everything that we are and believe and, and live out, Lord, that you alone are worthy of such reverence. And we thank you that you are and that, that you gave yourself for us on that cross just to uh, bring us that light and that salvation. What a wonderful Lord. We give you all our love and praise and glory this morning, Lord. And we thank you for this time together. And as we pray for the service to come, as we learn even more of, of you and what you have for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, next week, uh, we uh, have a less, lesson seven is on rewards. And I am going to be out of town, so uh, Brother Vince, uh, you'll have a little break from, from me, probably fortunately at this point. But on rewards, I, I'm hoping, I haven't, I've read through it some, but I'll be a little more fun. <laughs> I always feel like I'm beating up on you, but I guess it's because I'm beating up on myself, so don't take it personal. But... Uh, uh, rewards, you know, what? Think, we don't just do all this because we're told to. I mean, we should. And if, that, if that's all we did, that'd be great. But he's going to give us rewards, undeserving as we are. So that's exciting. So as we sing, as we close and, and take our break, uh, let's continue to reach out for higher ground. <laughs>